My message for the people in office is you're either with us or against us. We are losing our lives while the adults are playing around. President Trump, you control the House of Representatives, you control the Senate, and you control the executive. You haven't taken a single bill for mental health care or gun control and passed it, and that's pathetic. We are old enough to understand why someone might want to discredit us for their own political purposes, but we will not be silenced. We are going to be the kids that you read about in textbooks, not because we are going to be another statistic about mass shootings in America, but because it's just as David said, we are going to be the last mass shooting. Welcome back to AM Joy. This week, we all got to meet the new faces of the resistance. After surviving the mass shooting that claimed the lives of 17 of their classmates and teachers, the students of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, emerged as the forefront of the national debate over gun control, taking the lead with their impassioned and compelling demands for reform. And the message that has become a rallying cry for their growing movement, never again. With their courageous activism, they joined the long history of young people in America calling for change by speaking truth to power. This week's images of student walkouts across the country recalled the images from May 2, 1963, the day of the Children's Crusade, when more than 1,000 children in Birmingham, Alabama, organized by Martin Luther King Jr.'s Southern Christian Leadership Conference, walked out of their classrooms to protest segregation only to be met with arrests, fire hoses, and dogs on the orders of Birmingham's notorious police commissioner, Eugene Bull Connor. The Children's Crusade, which eventually led to Connor's removal and to support for the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, was a pivotal early victory for King and a galvanizing movement moment for the civil rights movement. It was followed a year later by the Freedom Summer, during which Northern college students joined young activists of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, many of them not yet old enough to vote, but who faced down the terror of Jim Crow Mississippi as they worked to increase black voter registration in the state. These young people were the inspiration for countless others who followed in their footsteps, from student protesters against the Vietnam War to the more recent youth-led movements like the Dream Defenders crusade against Stand Your Ground and the young activists declaring Black Lives Matter in protests against police violence. Right up to this week, when a new generation stepped forward to lead the way for our nation on gun reform. And joining me now are Leah wright Rigur, Assistant Professor of Public Policy at the Harvard Kennedy School, Philip Agnew, co-director of the Dream Defenders, Florida State Representative Keone McGee, and MoveOn.org's Kareen Jean-Pierre. Thank you all for being here. I actually want to come to you first on this, Leah, because the history um, belies some of the criticism of these kids in Parkland. Yes. They've been called too young. Mm -hmm. They can't vote, so why should we listen to them? They mm -hmm. shouldn't be leading the movement because they're just kids. Clearly, the history says differently. Yes, so clearly the history says otherwise. I mean, Ella Baker says it, I think, best in, in 1960 when she tells a group of young people. And she was like 30. Right, one, right. 30. so she was, she, yeah. was, and she was the old one of the group. Yeah. Right? She's telling a group of teenagers, she's telling a group of college students that this is bigger than a hamburger, that these sit ins, that these protests, that, that students, that young people have real power to institute change in America. So we see that through the course of the civil rights movement, where children are always at the forefront, that they're always doing the work, whether it be through, say, the Children's Crusade, whether it be through the sit ins, whether it be through something like the March from Washington, right? We, re we forget that Diane Nash, that John Lewis are very, very young when they're participating in these things. We uh, forget that, say, Kathy, uh, Kathleen Cleaver uh, is very, very young when she's participating in uh, the Student Nonviolent uh, student non Coordinating Committee, or SNCC. Mm -hmm. um, and even when we think about moments, right, in, in uh, frustrating moments that build to this, um, somebody like Claudette Colvin right, uh, is only about 14 years old when she refuses to get up from her seat and is arrested uh, during the early stages of uh, these bus boycotts and these Before bus Before Rosa Parks. Right? Before Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. So there very much is a legacy and tradition of young people taking action, uh, taking action in uh, instituting major and significant changes. Yeah, absolutely. I tell my students at Newhouse all the time, you know, these activists, when you're reading about these history books and these what seem like, you know, the olden days, these kids were their age. Exactly. These are kids, right? They're kids and college students. Um, and Philip Agnew, I got to know you when you 
were, you know, a kid. Everyone's a kid to me now uh, that I'm in my auntie dome. Um, <laughs> but I met you when you were basically a kid, and you guys, you mm -hmm. and the Dream Defenders, were sitting in. You guys did a sit-in for almost, I think, 30 days in the governor's yep. office in Florida. Rick Scott, who's getting all kind of kudos now for wanting to do little bitty, tiny, incremental changes on gun, con on gun control. You guys sat in on his office to protest Stand Your Ground, when a lot of adults didn't want to touch Stand Your Ground. And I want to read you a little excerpt from a story that was written. It was called Necessary Trouble. A woman named Sarah Jaffe wrote about you guys, mm. and she wrote the following. Um, that was the night that the governor, that governor Scott arrived after having refused to meet with you. He showed the protesters his boots, which were adorned with the Confederate flag alongside the U.S. flag, and told them there was nothing he could do. He suggested they organize a prayer vigil. Tell us a little bit about that encounter with Governor Rick Scott. I mean, it was illuminating. And um, for us, we had demanded a meeting from the time that we got there. We had an analysis of the problem. Uh, we thought that we had the national pressure and p potentially the political will to be able to move uh, the governor. And uh, what we saw right then is how deeply entrenched the moneyed interests in this state are in guiding the, the decisions of our elected officials. And we saw, when he showed us those boots, we saw very, very clearly uh, what he represented and what was important to him. And I think, um, you know, we're looking forward to working with the Parkland students because they're going to learn a crucial lesson that here in the state of Florida, nothing moves unless it's forced. And you've got Marion Hammer, who was mentioned earlier. You've got the NRA. You've got corporations that are pushing these politicians. And so, you know, that meeting was, was jarring. And that was at the beginning of our city. And we didn't leave. We stayed another 28 days after that. Mm -hmm. And we learned a crucial lesson then that we've got to organize and we've got a lot of work to do. Yeah, indeed. And as you said, nothing uh, in Florida moves unless it's forced, and sometimes not even then. And you uh, would know that very, better than most, uh, State Representative Keone McGee. Uh, yourself, a pretty young legislature. Um, we saw, I saw you speaking in Tallahassee. You were one of the pa uh, passionate speakers there with those young people. Tell us a little bit about what it does take to move Florida on something like guns, and do you think that it is more possible now than it was with Stand Your Ground? And, and good morning, Joy, and thank you for having me. The, the, the short answer is yes. What it's going to take is the political will, the political courage. Uh, as the, the world watched as I proposed the motion on the House floor to bring about the debate, the discussion, the vote to ban this AR-15, I was saddened to learn that I watched my friends, my colleagues who are mothers and fathers who, by the way, are elected officials, when 71 of them voted no, not to hear the cries of these kids who had been victimized. I was utterly shocked. As a matter of fact, we, we, once we realized that the vote had gone down at 71 votes, nay, not to hear that discussion, the real question began to uh, circulate around was, what's next? And as I spoke to those kids out on the Florida House Capitol, I wanted, them to, re I wanted to remind them that 55 years ago, people did the exact same thing that they were doing that particular day at the House Capitol. And that's what gave and motivated me to be as passionate as I was, because it makes no sense that in a state of Florida where the Republican Party has controlled the House, the Senate, they have controlled the, the governor's mansion for over 20 years, that we have yet to have that discussion what our kids are asking us to do. And unfortunately now, the, the incremental changes that our governor is proposing are still falling mm -hmm. short. They're falling short. Yeah. The real answer is, how do we keep these guns out of people's hands who do not deserve them? Joy, in the state of Florida, it is easier to buy an AR-15 than it is to buy cough syrup, yeah. cough medicine. Yeah. And it is, we have to change this. Yeah, kids who can't buy a lottery ticket can go and buy a, a you know, the just short of a, of a military-style assault weapon. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Karine Jean-Pierre, Turn to another young, uh, young young lady here who is an organizer here with MoveOn.org. So you know for grassroots organizing. Um, you know, the, the, we talked about the Children's March in Birmingham uh, in 1963. People forget that the March on Washington in August of 1963 was about the slow pace of the 1963 right. Civil right. Rights Act. that didn't right. pass right. until it became the 1964 Civil Rights Act after the assassination of a president. How um, do you connect uh, organized movements like your own grassroots movements to these young people and also to sort of impart uh, on them the patience to know how slow sometimes change can be? 
Yeah. So I so in um, in during the civil rights movement, young people were the conscience, right, of the civil rights movement. And what we're seeing now today is the same thing with young people being the conscience of uh, of what's going on with this gun gun reform debate. And so one of the most encouraging stats that I read this week was that um, 8.6 million uh, teenagers in 2016 were who were not able to vote in 2016 are going to be eligible to vote in 2018. And it, that number jumps up to 16.6 .6 million of, of young people are going to be able to vote in 2020. Um, and so I think that's that's the key. We really have to continue to encourage these young people to to take that step. And OK, now you're 18, you're eligible to vote. Yep. you got to vote. You have to take that step. And so it's up to us. It's up to organizations like myself, or ours, Move On, and also the Democratic Party to encourage and to excite them and to say, hey, and educate them, continue to educate them and say, this is why we need to do this if you want to make real change, to bring progressive leaders in, not just Democrats, but progressive leaders who are going to make real change. Yeah, I mean, Leah, the numbers do not lie. Um, let's look at the projected population by generation. And we're going to put up a little chart here from the Pew Research uh, Organization. Look at that chart at the top. Millennials are much larger in number. Boomers going way down in number. The silent generation going way down in number. Even my generation, Gen X, uh, headed on the down curve. Millennials are a huge generation. And then let's look at another chart that shows the U.S. births by year, just how large these generations are. And for those who are looking at it on TV, and it may look small to you. There are 47 million total births in the silent generation. Boomers were a boom because there were 76 million of them. Uh, My Little Generation X was 55 million people. Look at millennials, 50, 66 million. They are then dwarfed by post-millennials, 69 million of them. They are the majority, the emerging yep. majority. They're more of them than baby boomers. The question is, can they be moved to do what the civil rights movement era kids understood, which is that voting is the power that we're fighting for, not just integration? So, I, I mean, absolutely. So uh, part of this, part of I think what we have to think about is, one, uh, you have this really good, this really giant group of young people who are increasingly uh, becoming active with politics in one way or another, uh, largely at the local level, but a lot of times in movement politics. And they're very, very clear. Pew is very clear about this. Gen uh, forward surveys are very clear about their feelings about violence, including gun control, is one of the issues of their generation. Yeah. Um, so one of the important things, too, to point out is that many of these uh, many of these people have been integrated and have been working with organizations like the Dream Defenders, uh, organizations like We the Protesters, uh, these organizations that have had at their heart anti-violence uh, and anti-trauma measures yeah. towards black bodies. So this is not new. Yeah. This is something that young Young people have been concerned about for a very long time and now what's happening is that those movements are coalescing and that absolutely means that that something may happen mm -hmm. uh, in terms of policy in terms of voting in terms of making change yeah Philip jump in because you are you are part of yeah. one of those, those yeah. groups <laughs> Yeah, you know, and, and I want to draw attention to one thing. I think, um, you know, if you ask a doctor, one of the worst things you can do is misdiagnose a disease. And one thing that we've learned over this time, you know, black people have always been the canary in the coal mine. We've always been on the front end of laying out an indictment of the system. But one thing our organization and groups around the country have, have recognized is that um, gun control, gun violence, that mental health are all symptoms. But those aren't the disease. The disease that we're talking about here is a cold of violence, of exploitation, of chauvinism, of uh, dominance, of individualism, an economic system called capitalism, right, that has undergirded our entire society. And so when we talk about the solutions to the problem, we've got to talk about solutions like gun control around mass shootings, but we've also got to address the 17 kids that are killed in Liberty City. Um, and we, th the solutions to those, I hate to use this term, but um, there's no silver bullet right here with the solutions that we're talking about. I I think we've got to broaden this discussion, right, to not just talk about the symptoms, but the deep economic traumas that people are going through and an economic system that undergirds every part of our society and allows and creates the conditions for mental health and for the things that we see not only in mass shootings, but that we see with inner city youth across the country. And so these are the things that we've learned as we're engaging in this discussion about solutions that it's got to be far more than what we're talking about and the analysis of the problem that yeah. has come from people 
in the movement that gets us to this point. I mean, we can't wait to really build with the Parkland students because mm -hmm. that is an opportunity that we have to build a movement that doesn't just result in more police yeah. because we've seen that more police in schools and in communities is not the solution. Yeah, absolutely. I think the word for it is intersectionality. Um, yeah. Really great panel. Thank you guys very much. Leah wright Ricker, Philip Agnew, State Representative Keone McGee, and Karine Jean-Pierre. Thank you guys very much. And for more on my thoughts, check out my newest piece in the Daily Beast, uh, on the Daily Beast, called Remember This Week. It's the beginning of the end of the NRA's reign of terror. And coming up, Paul Manafort has a choice, dying in prison or turning on Trump. That's next.